Hello, my name is Curtis Hartshorn, and welcome back to our seventh class on the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. If you get out your workbook and open up your Bible to the book of Ephesians, this class will stay with the book of Ephesians as we look at the plain saving gospel. That seems to be the central theme of the gospel passages that are in Ephesians. So I hope you will enjoy this study. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Three main points that we're going to make. The first one is, the gospel will set you free. Now as you hear that, I'm sure you're thinking, no, Curtis, you've misquoted that verse. John 8, 32 says, the truth will make you free. Yes, the truth and the gospel are one and the same. And I plan to show you that before the end of this class. So my point is, the gospel will set you free. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, through the gospel, we become redeemed, forgiven, recipients of God's grace. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Man, there's a lot in those few verses. And, and uh, let's just start taking part just a, a little bit at a time here. Verse, verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And as I stated there in point number one, through the gospel, we become redeemed. We have redemption. Redeemed means bought back. We've been paid for by the blood of Christ. We've been forgiven. All the sins that we have done in the past have been wiped out through the blood of Christ. And we are recipients of God's grace. God has been gracious to us. Grace is, is unmerited favor. It's something that we don't deserve. God is well within his rights to cast us into an eternal hell for the way we have treated him and the way we have uh, uh, defamed his word. But he is gracious to us and he is forgiving and he has redeemed us. Another thing that we learn from this passage, number two, is that through the gospel, we learn the will of God. That's verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. I'll talk about mystery in a little while, but he has made known to us his will. It's important to know the will of God. I want to do the will of God, don't you? Well, through the gospel, we're able to discover what God's will is, what his will is for our lives as individuals and what his will is for us collectively as his church, as his body. We learn the will of God through the gospel. Another thing we see in this passage, number three, is that through the gospel we obtain an inheritance, verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance. An inheritance is something that is promised to a child. You have to be a child, not, not a servant, not, not just a, a casual acquaintance. But as children of God, we are blessed to receive an inheritance. Another thing about this gospel that sets us free 
is that number four, the gospel is the message of truth for salvation. That's exactly what he says in the verse that I just read you a moment ago. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel. And so the gospel is truth. But this is the gospel of your salvation. This is the message that saves us. And fifth and finally under this, the gospel set us free. At salvation is when we are sealed with the Holy Spirit in Christ. That's also verse 13. Having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So a seal was something that was, was put on an object and it showed ownership. If this had the king's seal, that means it belonged to the king. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. We are sealed and the seal that we receive is the promised Holy Spirit. Everybody talks in Revelation about the mark of the beast. What about the mark of the lamb? The mark of the lamb is the promised Holy Spirit with which we are sealed, with which we belong to God. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is where Peter said to them, the ones who were asking what do we need to do, how do we make this right after they understood that they had crucified the Son of God and that, that they were separated from God. He said, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice he doesn't say the gifts. He's not talking about miraculous gifts. He's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And it's like a stamp on your forehead. Think about it that way. Boom. You belong to God. You're sealed with God. When does that happen? At baptism. After you repent of your sins and you're baptized into Christ, your sins are forgiven and you received this gift of the Holy Spirit. And that is how the gospel is able to set you free. Point B, as we talk about the gospel, let's talk about entrance into God's kingdom. Now, point number one under this that I want to make is that the house of God is built on the foundation of of God's Word. This is in chapter 2 of Ephesians, and toward the end of the chapter, we'll start in verse 9, or excuse me, 19. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens. You're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Paul says to this church in Ephesus, to these young Christians, he says, you're not strangers anymore, especially you Gentiles. The Gentiles were outcast. And the Jews were God's chosen people. And he's explained that's all changed now. You're no longer strangers. You're fellow citizens. You are part of God's household. What's another word for household? The family of God. And then Paul says, let me illustrate this for you. Now, before we get into this illustration, I want to explain. The church is not a building. We use the word that way. We say, well, I'm going to go down to the church. Well, that's not a physical location. Ekklesia is the Greek word for church. It means those who are called out. It's the people. It's never a building. But Paul illustrates it here. If it were like a, a building, a structure, this is the way it would look. So on this building, we have a cornerstone. And it says here that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, verse 20. The cornerstone was the first stone laid on old buildings and even new buildings. I one time had a Bible study with a, a contractor, and he told me we still use cornerstones. I didn't know this, but, but that first stone has to be perfect because everything is measured off of that one. Jesus is the perfect cornerstone. But in addition to the cornerstone, you still have a foundation of this building. And he says the foundation, verse 20 as well, 
is the apostles and the prophets. Well, the apostles and the prophets, they're not even alive anymore. How can be the foundation of the church that we're a part of today? Well, here's how they can be the foundation. The Old Testament was written by men who were known as prophets. The New Testament was written by a few prophets as well, but mostly it was written by apostles. What happens when you put the Old Testament and the New Testament together? What do you get? You get the Bible. And so the Bible is the foundation of the Lord's church, of, the God, of God's household. The church is built on the foundation of the Bible. And what does that mean? Well, in a practical way, that means whatever the Bible says, this is, this is what we follow when we are building His church. So if you, if you go to a church and they're doing or they're practicing something that is not with the Bible, that's not Jesus' church. His church, that He is the cornerstone of, is built on the foundation of the Bible. Things that, that go against the Bible, that's not Him. That's not His. The true church has this foundation, and that foundation is the very words of God. So we're talking about entrance into God's kingdom. Stick with me because this, uh, this will blow your mind a little bit, but the Bible is truth. That's what John 17, verse 17 says. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The gospel is truth. I just showed you that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. The truth of the gospel or the truth, the gospel. So gospel is truth. The Bible is truth. Gospel is truth. Therefore, gospel Bible, truth, is the foundation of God's household. So if the Bible is the foundation of God's household, the truth is the foundation of God's household, the gospel is the foundation of God's household. Number two, the gospel is what determines whether someone is a fellow member of God's household or not. When we get to chapter 3, right on the heels of what we just read, he goes on to say, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. Now there's a word mystery again. Keep that on the shelf. We'll, we'll unpack that here in a little bit. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power. Paul starts off and he says, I, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I, I, uh, I am bound to Him. I'm, I'm fettered to God. We are inseparable of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. This is my mission. That's what Paul saw himself and was actually told to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He says, now let me, let me reveal this mystery. Again, I'll get to the word mystery here in a little bit, which in other generations was not made known. He says, other people didn't know this. He says, we're blessed to have this information. And here is the mystery. Here's what has been revealed. Verse 6, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, they are fellow members, and they are fellow partakers. Point number three, every fellow member is also a fellow heir and a fellow partaker of the promises of God. So if you're a fellow member, that means you belong. If you're a fellow heir, that means you, like I said, you're a child 
and you're receiving your inheritance and you're a partaker. You are, are welcome to anything in the kingdom, the, the blessings of being in Christ. These are made available to you. Let's talk in this last section about gospel weaponry, number C. And under that, I want to make this point that this is about weaponry and not equipment because this is not a game. This is a war. We're not in a game here. We are at war with Satan. And a war you have to take seriously. It's not like you get fouls and, okay, and okay, well, we lost that game, no problem. No, this is a battle for your soul and for the souls of others. A war. In Ephesians chapter 6, he describes this battle equipment that we need in order to survive in this war. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, and starting in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He says we need this armor. We need to put this on because we're in a battle. We're in a war. And, and Satan's not playing around. He plays, he, he's serious. It's not a game to him, and it shouldn't be a game to us. Interesting thing about this war, number two, your war is really not with people. That's what he means when he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's with evil. People are not your problem. Now, you may have a problem with people, and you may think people are your problem. But in the overall scheme of things, people are really not your problem. Evil is your problem. That's what you're really fighting against. And when you start fighting against people and not against evil, then you get off track. That's one way that Satan gets us off track is we're so uh, uh, snipping at each other and backbiting each other and, and hurting each other like Galatians talks about. It's not about people. It's about evil. These evil forces. And you are at war with them. And if you're going to go into battle, you've got to make sure you have the full armor of God. Number three, each part of your spiritual armor is essential for survival. You can't leave any of these off. Twice he says to put on the full armor of God, once in verse 11 and again in verse 13. Put on the full armor of God. Don't leave any of this out. You don't want to go into battle and, you know, well, I didn't have time to grab my helmet, so I'll just go on in anyway. No. Or, or the, the, the boots, the, the foot protection that you need, or your blessed breastplate. You, know, the, you don't want to miss any of this stuff, your shield, your sword. You've got to have it all. It all fits together and it all protects you. And so each part of this spiritual armor is essential for your survival. Fourth thing we learn from this passage is that the gospel is necessary equipment in your spiritual armor. It's mentioned in verse 15 as part of what shields or what protects or shods your feet. The gospel protects you. It is part of this armor that you have to have. If you don't have the gospel or if you have it taught to you incorrectly, you don't have a protection that you need in the spiritual battle against Satan. One other important thing about this gospel Notice number five, 
the gospel brings you peace. It is called very specifically in verse 15, preparation of the gospel of peace. It sounds almost contradictory to what we're discussing in this whole chapter because Harry's describing this war and we're in battle. And he says, make sure that you have the gospel of peace. In the midst of battle, in the midst of of fighting with, with these flaming arrows of Satan flying around us, we can be at peace. We can have a calmness, a peace that passes all understanding through the gospel. Just a knowledge of the gospel and a, and a knowledge that we have received it by obeying the gospel, which we'll be talking about here in just a few classes now. That can bring us great peace in our lives. All right, point D, let's talk about the mystery of the gospel. I, I promised you this a couple of times that we were going to do this, so let's take a look at it. The gospel was once hidden, but now it is revealed. Look at verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, of which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The gospel was hidden, and now it's revealed. Now, how do you know that, Curtis? Well, here's how I know that, because that's exactly what mystery means in the Bible. When you see the word mystery, and we've seen it several times here in Ephesians, it doesn't mean like something, I'm scratching my head, i got to figure this out, oh, this is too hard. That's not the way the Bible uses mystery. Mystery just means something that at one time it was hidden. People didn't know it, now they know it. Not that they had to figure it out, it was just revealed to them. It wasn't revealed in the past, now it's revealed. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the mystery of the gospel. Remember in our last class, we talked about how the, the gospel actually goes all the way back to Abraham in a sense. It's been around a long time. This good news as it was developing, as it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now we're seeing the fulfillment. Now it's revealed to us. The mystery of the gospel is in our grasp. And because of that, number two, there is no reason the gospel cannot be taught with boldness. Look at verse 19. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. We should be bold. And the reason, number three, is we are ambassadors. Wherever God places us because of the gospel. You know what an ambassador is? That's a representative of, of a country or of a king. And we are representatives of our king wherever we go. Wherever you're going today, work, school, into the community, wherever it is, you are an ambassador of Christ. You have a specific role that you play. You are to be an example. People are looking to you to see what you do and how you behave. And your example can have a positive or a negative effect on other people. But you are an ambassador. And because of that, we should be bold. Point number four, be bold in your proclamation of the gospel. Look again at verse 20. Of which I am an ambassador in change, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says that's what should go on. I should be boldly proclaiming this gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. No need for me to be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is something to speak boldly because, as we've learned here in Ephesians, it is the plain saving gospel. How blessed we are to have access to God's Word so we can learn what this gospel is. And there's more to learn. We haven't even got to the book of Philippians. That's coming up next. And in Philippians, we're going to talk about defense of the plain gospel. I really hope that you'll be there for that next class. God bless you.